In December of 2013, Aviation Week first broke the news to the world that the US was secretly developing a large stealthy reconnaissance aircraft meant to fill the role left empty by the SR-71's retirement. This aircraft Aviation Week claimed was designed with a heavy emphasis on all aspects stealth and long duration flight giving Uncle Sam high-flying eyes in the sky over even the most heavily contested battle spaces. But outside the reporting of Bill Sweetman and Amy Butler, there was no actual evidence that this aircraft existed. That is, until the following year, when Air Force Lieutenant General Bob Otto casually verified the existence of a highly secretive high-altitude stealth spy plane with Air Force's magazine. And with that, the legend of the RQ-180 was born. Let's talk about what may be the most highly classified aircraft the US has fielded in 30 years. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. Let's take a second to talk about today's sponsor, Ground News. You guys already know that Ground News is an invaluable part of my research toolbox, but Ground News does a whole lot more than just keep you in the loop. It also makes it very easy to identify usually tough to spot forms of media bias and the news coverage we consume. Earlier this week, a Russian missile strike in Ukraine landed perilously close to the convoy carrying not just the Ukrainian president, but also the Greek Prime Minister. And by using Ground News, I can see that 114 news outlets have already covered this story, including 11 left-leaning outlets, 15 right-leaning outlets, and 39 centrist ones. And as you can see, left-leaning outlets used very descriptive language in their headlines, using phrases like, very close, or a blast rocks, referencing this missile strike. Whereas some right-leaning outlets were more matter-of-fact in their coverage, highlighting the people who were actually killed in the strike, or just relaying the story without any descriptive language at all. Ground News assesses the reliability and bias of each news outlet based on ratings provided by three different independent news monitoring organizations. They'll even tell you who's funding a publication. And thanks to their location feature, you can not only compare stories based on political affiliation, but geographical location as well, seeing which nations are covering a story and which nations aren't. My job requires staying on top of global events, and for months now, Ground News has been my first stop every morning to see what's going on since I signed off the night before. And if you wanna add it to your morning too, I can get you a good deal. Go to ground.news slash sandbox with two X's, or just follow the link in the description below to get 30% off a subscription to the same vantage plan that I use in my research. Again, that's ground.news slash sandbox to get 30% off the same vantage plan I use in my research. Ground News keeps me in the loop, and I know they can help you out too. So let's start with some open honesty. I haven't covered the RQ-180 so far for good reason. There's just not a whole lot out there in the way of verifiable facts about this highly secretive platform. Now, I don't like to trade in rumor and speculation on this channel. I think the rest of the internet does more than enough of that for everyone. But I found that by exploring the context of when this aircraft went into development and what objectives the U.S. military was likely trying to meet, that we can draw some pretty interesting conclusions about what the RQ-180 is, and maybe much more importantly, what it could become in the not-too-distant future. These days, the U.S. has a number of publicly disclosed, but nonetheless highly secretive aircraft in active development, including a stealth bomber in the B-21 Raider, and at least two new stealth fighters in the Air Force's Next Generation Air Dominance and the Navy's FAXX programs, respectively. And while these efforts have all managed to maintain a high level of secrecy, despite an outpouring of public attention, it would be a mistake to believe that all of Uncle Sam's most advanced and capable programs receive similar levels of disclosure. Some efforts remain hidden even for years after entering operational service, only occasionally breaching the surface of public awareness for an instant before disappearing again into the depths of covert operations. 
The stealth Blackhawks used in the 2011 operation to kill Osama bin Laden, for instance, would likely never have been acknowledged and, in fact, still don't officially exist, despite the intact tail section of one that crashed being left behind after the raid. These classified programs represent some of the most advanced and cutting-edge military technologies on the planet, and an important part of maintaining the strategic advantage their existence provides is keeping the true extent of their capabilities a secret. Stealth Blackhawks are far from the most advanced classified hardware Uncle Sam has logging hours in the sky today. In fact, there's a solid chance that title actually belongs to the flying wing that we in the public know as the RQ-180. But admittedly, that might not even be its name. This Northrop Grumman-sourced platform is likely the most advanced intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance gathering asset ever to see flight, and based on media reports, has likely been in operational service for years already. But many have posited that this aircraft is far more than a highly secretive spy plane. In fact, it could be the central spoke of America's new approach to air warfare, ruling on high from 70,000 feet as a vast array of next-generation stealth fighters, bombers, drones, and even weapon systems take their cues from and send data back to its high-altitude throne. In other words, while the RQ-180 may be capable of filling the SR-71's shoes, at least in some respects, evidence suggests that this aircraft has a much larger purpose in mind. But to understand what the RQ-180 is, we need to understand why it was made. In the days following the terror attacks of September 11, 2001, the U.S. found itself rapidly shifting back to a wartime footing, marshalling its forces for a military response that would ultimately span decades. But as Uncle Sam's gun clubs geared up for a fight, decision makers at the Pentagon found themselves staring down the barrel of an SR-71-sized problem. Despite America's sprawling satellite infrastructure, there simply weren't enough satellites with the right kinds of capabilities to provide military planners with the levels of intelligence they needed to bring America's military power to bear. The United States needed a serious influx of intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities to cover the sprawling expanses of not one, but two Middle Eastern battlefields. And at the time, there were no platforms in service that could do the job quite like the Blackbird. By September 13th, just two days after the 9-11 attacks, the Pentagon had already drafted a $45 million plan to bring the Blackbird back out of retirement for the second time, aiming to use the aircraft to collect timely intelligence on terror targets throughout the Middle East, while also providing what Air Force General Bob Baylor once told us was called Blackbird Diplomacy, namely, shaking the windows of potential adversaries with well-timed sonic booms as a reminder of the ever-present deterrent that is American air power. This proposal, however, lacked the political support it needed to manifest, and instead, America's defense apparatus began funneling billions of dollars into the maturation of existing ISR platforms and technologies, and more importantly, into the development of entirely new ones. Two months after the attacks, Northrop Grumman's high-flying RQ-4 Global Hawk entered service. Existing platforms like the MQ-1 Predator quickly became rock stars, prompting new investment into the maturation of its successor, the MQ-9 Reaper. A bevy of smaller UAVs soon followed, like the RQ-11 Raven, which entered service in 2003, and the RQ-20 Puma that followed suit in 2007. These platforms provided the ISR foundation on which the global war on terror was built, gradually reshaping the way American forces could leverage timely intelligence in the fight. Gone were the days of U-2s and SR-71s snapping pictures on miles-long rolls of film to be developed over the span of days. These uncrewed aircraft could relay live video feeds directly to commanders and even Washington-based decision-makers in real time. This revolution in intelligence and target acquisition quickly began to snowball as more commanders came to understand the capabilities and the value these ISR platforms could provide. 
Before long, the U.S. found itself unable to field enough modern ISR aircraft to meet these growing needs. And this is a problem that persists to this very day. I'm going to quote Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Evans from the Army's Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Task Force. There's what I'll describe as an insatiable demand for airborne ISR collection capability across all the combatant commands. We hear from them on a weekly basis about needing more and the joint staff being unable to provide more due to capacity limitations. But all of America's investment into new ISR aircraft meant to meet this demand came with a massive flaw. In the interest of keeping costs down, they were purpose-built for the permissive airspaces of the global war on terror. While the MQ-1 service ceiling of 25,000 feet meant occasionally it might run across a shoulder-fired weapon like a man pad, the most potent threat most of these aircraft faced during operational flights was the weather. And as a result, most of the new ISR aircraft fielded by the U.S. military lacked the stealth or the performance that would be required to survive in contested airspace. But not every new ISR platform was quite so short-sighted. In the early 2000s, Lockheed Martin began development on a stealthy flying wing drone that could provide ISR coverage inside the contested airspace of nations like Iran. Building off of previous efforts like the RQ-3 Dark Star and the Polecat, this secretive drone came with a wingspan of just about 65 feet 7 inches, making it a fair air bit wider than the A-10 Warthog. This aircraft was first spotted by the public operating out of Kandahar in Afghanistan, earning it the unofficial moniker, the Beast of Kandahar. We would soon learn from the Air Force, however, that its real designation was RQ-170, operated by the Air Combat Command's 432nd Wing at Creech Air Force Base in Nevada and the 30th Reconnaissance Squadron at the Tanapah Test Range in Nevada as well. Now, it's believed that at least one of these stealthy aircraft was operating in the airspace above the compound during Operation Neptune Spear as Osama bin Laden was being brought to justice. But just seven months after that, the worst would happen. On December 4th, 2011, Iranian officials announced the successful hijacking of an RQ-170 that had violated their airspace, claiming the Iranian Army's Electronic Warfare Unit had managed to seize control of the aircraft mid-flight, bringing it down largely intact for the purposes of analysis and soon some level of reverse engineering. The high-flying cat was out of the proverbial bag, but... As we've discussed on this channel before, the RQ-170 was far from the only secret tucked away in Uncle Sam's hangars by this time. Now, we can't say for sure, but it now seems evident that the platform we've come to know as the RQ-180 matured out of the Joint Unmanned Combat Air Systems program that produced the Boeing X-45 and the Northrop Grumman X-47 as well as the subsequent X-47B that still makes the rounds online as a part of conspiratorial posts from time to time, thanks to its very futuristic-looking appearance and some really rad photos of it operating off of an aircraft carrier. But based on reports, Northrop Grumman likely received the developmental contract for the RQ-180, building off of these previous efforts, in 2008, which is right around the same time we know Lockheed Martin began work on their own solution for the ISR problem in the SR-72. But unlike the SR-72, which evidence suggests is very much still in testing, it looks as though the RQ-180 moved into low-rate initial production as early as 2013. Now, unlike the ISR platforms that came to define the global war on terror, this aircraft was purpose-built to survive in the most hostile airspace on the planet, providing persistent intelligence in the face of rapidly advancing ground-based radar arrays and even airborne adversary combat air patrols. Now, it's believed to have accomplished this through a combination of a highly aerodynamically efficient design and an emphasis placed on what Northrop Grumman calls all aspect stealth, meaning stealth against radar arrays operating across a wide band of frequencies, making it much more difficult to detect and target than the F-22, F-35, or even the B-2 Spirit. 
Like the X47B, the RQ180 is generally understood to leverage more of a cranked kite plane form, departing slightly from the flying wing that we've come to know in stealth bombers. Now, I say generally understood for a reason. To date, there are no officially acknowledged photographs of this aircraft at all. But there are several that we believe are actually of the RQ-180 in flight, and we'll get to them in just a few minutes. Based on reports, the aircraft is more than twice the size of the RQ-170, and as such, potentially has as much as twice the fuel capacity for longer duration flights. It has a reported wingspan of around 130 feet, making it smaller than a B-2 Spirit and not all that far off from a B-21 Raider. It has an arcing jet inlet placed on the top side of the aircraft to limit radar detectability from below, and a similar trailing edge to the B-21 in the rear. Among some circles, it's widely believed that the RQ-180 is known to those operating it as the Great White Bat, as well as Shikaka, which is a reference to the movie Ace Ventura 2, When Nature Calls, which is probably my wife's favorite aviation anecdote of all time. She loves that movie. I don't know what to tell you. Now, according to reports, this aircraft saw testing over Area 51 between 2010 and 2014. And by 2015, the Air Force had at least seven RQ-180s in their possession. By 2017, these aircraft were ready for service, allegedly joining existing fleets of RQ-180s. RQ-4 Global Hawks and U-2 spy planes operated by the 9th Operations Group out of California's Beale Air Force Base, though another detachment of the same unit reportedly operates RQ-180s out of Guam as well, providing the U.S. with a strategically invaluable proving ground for long-duration ISR flights. The first possible sighting of the RQ-180 seems to have taken place in November of 2020, flying over the Mojave Desert in California, not far from Edwards Air Force Base. Now, some have contended that this sighting may have actually been of Lockheed Martin's Polecat, an experimental aircraft with a similar overall shape, but the Polecat program ended in 2006, some 14 years earlier. On September 2nd of 2021, landscape photographer Michael Fugnit spotted an unusual-looking aircraft flying high above him in Santa Magdalena, Philippines. Thinking fast, he grabbed his camera and snapped a single photo that was later published by the War Zone of a cranked kite plane form aircraft screaming across the sky above the Pacific. While it's believed this may have been a rare glimpse of the RQ-180, we can't say for sure, because we don't actually know what it looks like officially. A bit over a month later, what appeared to be the same aircraft was spotted again, this time in the sky above the Nevada dry lake bed commonly known as Area 51. That image was published by a popular website dedicated to keeping tabs on this classified facility, dreamlandresort.com, accompanied by this caption. A friend who wishes to remain anonymous and I were at the Groom Lake Road gate yesterday. I heard a faint aircraft noise and noticed a contrail straight above us, inside the Area 51 restricted airspace, heading roughly south-southwest. Through my image-stabilized binoculars, I first thought I was looking at a B-2 until I realized it had a pointed tail. The B-2 has a serrated tail. In all three instances, this highly secretive aircraft was photographed during daylight hours, which may explain the light color paint scheme. Like the B-21 Raider, which also boasts a light shade of gray as opposed to the B-2's flat black, this suggests these platforms are designed to operate at all hours of the day, rather than strictly under the cover of darkness. But the best look we may have gotten at the RQ-180 appears to have come just a few days later. On November 8, 2021, the Air Force Profession of Arms Center for Excellence posted a now infamous video called Heritage Today, ISR and Innovation. Now, we've discussed this very video in previous articles and videos because it includes a split-second peek at another high-altitude ISR aircraft that was in active development at the time, Lockheed Martin's hypersonic SR-72. But just a few seconds before that clip, the video also shows a computer-rendered image of an aircraft that bears the same cranked kite plane form as the RQ-180, as the narrator explains that biplanes that used to fill the ISR role have since been replaced 
by white bats. Now, to be honest, as far as hard confirmable facts go, that's pretty much the end of the story of the RQ-180 as it stands today. But there are some very compelling theories out there about how this platform may be leveraged in combat. And I don't think anyone has put together a more pragmatic or compelling argument in that regard than Tyler Rogaway over at the War Zone. In April of 2021, Rogaway published a treatise into the potential future applications for America's Great White Bat, describing it as the centerpiece of a forthcoming air combat revolution. Rogaway is clear in the essay that he's speaking largely in hypotheticals, but nonetheless presents a compelling case for the RQ-180's role as being much more than just another ISR platform. Rogaway envisions the RQ-180 as a high-altitude battle space manager, an all-purpose communications node and data-fusing delegator of instantly updated target information, mission objectives, emerging threats, and more, all by way of advanced mesh networks providing two-way encrypted data links with a vast array of next-generation aircraft flying below, an advanced intelligence and communication satellite operating far overhead. This incredible degree of battle space awareness would be all but immune to conventional forms of electronic warfare, using low probability of intercept, frequency hopping transmissions to turn every platform in the battle space into the eyes, ears, and kinetic enforcers of American will over even the most contested battle spaces. The essay is worth reading in its entirety. It's fairly lengthy, but he sums up at least some of the possibilities in one succinct example, explaining that this capability would allow aircraft inside contested airspace to effectively guide a variety of munitions launched from outside of it, providing real-time data about targets, threats, and the rapidly changing face of the battlefield. I'll quote him here. Let's say an RQ-180 is up over enemy territory, as well as a swarm of a dozen UCAVs, a flight of four F-35As, four F-22s, an RQ-170, and a pair of B-21s. Some of these assets can be tasked to use their own advanced radars to provide synthetic aperture radar mapping, or ground-moving target indicators of particular areas of interest, while the RQ-180 also collects this type of information on a far wider swath of the battle space. This type of coverage can be pre-arranged by sectors, or based on other real-time intelligence that points to needing a closer look at a particular area, or to help guide incoming missiles to their potentially moving targets. Put simply, if the F-35 is a quarterback in the sky, the RQ-180 may be the offensive coordinator, conducting its own ISR and even electronic warfare duties while also serving as an overall coordinator, relay node, and much more for aircraft operating even in heavily jammed environments. It could even be used to relay guidance information to aircraft and weapon systems operating inside GPS-denied battle spaces. We're talking about a platform that enables other platforms to be more than they can be on their own, effectively replacing other aircraft like E-8 Joint Stars and E-3 AWACS operating deeply inside contested airspace where those platforms would not be survivable. And thanks to its all-aspect stealth and highly aerodynamically efficient design, this is a platform that could operate at extremely high altitudes, higher than some surface-to-air missile systems could even reach, that is, if they even detected it in the first place. And based on the size of this aircraft, it's not unreasonable to assume that it could stay airborne inside contested airspace for 20 hours or more at a time, being remotely piloted by crews who transition in and out every six to eight hours to make sure there are always fresh eyes on the battle space. Now, we've spoken at length on this channel before about the incredible levels of situational awareness provided by the F-35s onboard sensors and data-fusing avionics, as well as how the B-21 Raiders ISR capabilities are expected to outstrip that of even the F-35. But now imagine combining and compounding all of that data, all of that sensor-fusing awareness into a single cohesive feed that can be relayed and leveraged by every warfighter 
on the battlefield. As assets are lost, the mesh networks compensate, filling those gaps and maintaining the same high degree of situational awareness no matter how the fight is going. Giving every warfighter, from the grunt on the ground to the NGAD pilot 70,000 feet above him, the same God's eye view of the fight. And if all that doesn't sound quite crazy enough, imagine being on the receiving end of that kind of offensive and trying to find a way to counter it. We may not even know the RQ-180's actual name, but the one thing we do know for sure is there's a whole lot of potential stuffed into that 130-foot wingspan. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.